Hi everyone, today we are going to talk about the psychology behind language acquisition and how language can influence thought. Definition of language. Language is going to be written, spoken, it can be gestured, so it can be your body language, any way that we use to communicate meaning. When we look at language development, language is a relatively new thing for humans. Now we look at something called the arc of language development. Language has developed for over thousands of years and it's how we've built culture because of our ability to transmit ideas from generation to generation. If we didn't have this, every new generation would have to start over and over again. Easy way of thinking about this, if you have a dog and your dog has puppies, your dog can't teach its puppies to sit or to stay or to do anything, you have to teach each new generation. But because of language, we can transmit new information to new generations without them ever having to discover it themselves. The other thing with language is language isn't always just what you say, but it's how you say it. So the how you say it part is called prosody, the pitch, the tone, the inflection, which means you can take a simple statement like, you look nice today, and turn it into something that sounds more snarky and sarcastic, like, you look nice today. Language has two basic uh, elements that you guys need to know about, symbols and grammar. Now the great thing about this, this is an English class, so you don't need to actually know the rules of grammar, and you should hopefully understand the symbols at least of English language, which would be your alphabet. When we're looking at symbols, we're looking at our alphabet, so the sounds to create our sentences. And also symbolically, you can look at any of our punctuation, where we pause, stop, any of those kind of terms. But really what you guys want to be aware of are what are called phonemes and morphemes. A phoneme is going to be the smallest unit of distinct sound. So when we're talking about a phoneme, the CH sound is one phoneme, the CH sound, where the C sound, K, is one phoneme. Morphemes are going to be smallest units that carry meaning. So here you have in the example the word bat is one morpheme. So it could be the bat that you hold when you play baseball or the animal that is a bat. But either way, the word here has one meaning. You put an S on the end of that, you now have added an additional meaning to that root word. So bat becomes bats, there's two morphemes, bat and then the S, which means that there are multiples. You're going to have to be able to tell me on a test the difference between morphemes and phonemes when comparing words. In the first example, cat versus chat, each word has one meaning. Cat meaning the animal and chat meaning a short conversation. So the morphemes are the same, they each have one. The C and the CH, the CH is a blended sound, so it's a single phoneme. So cat, each letter makes its own unique sound, C-A-T, and in chat, the CH makes one sound, the A and the T. So there's three phonemes in each word. So they're equal in phonemes as well. Morphemes and phonemes are equal. In the second example, you have log versus dogs. Log, L-O-G, each individual, an individual letter makes its own sound. And when we're talking about how many meanings that word has, it has a single meaning. Dogs, D-O-G-S, there are four phonemes to logs three phonemes, so dogs has more phonemes, and since there is a suffix on the end, you know that there's an additional meaning, so dog plus s meaning multiple of that animal, so there are two morphemes. In this situation, dogs has more phonemes and more morphemes than the word log. You get down to the bottom one, and you're never going to get a word this complicated or long to tell me about something like the number of phonemes, but register versus pre-registered. Register, the root word, one meaning. The pre and the ed at the end, the suffix and prefix, those add meaning. So the prefix of pre, meaning before, register to sign up for, and then ed in the past gives you that this one has three morphemes. So register versus pre-registered, register has one morpheme while pre-registered has three. Another concept to talk about is phonemic restoration, to restore something. So phonemic sound restoration, sound bringing back sound. Really, essentially, that's all this means. When we talk about phonemic restoration, often when we're having conversations or we're listening to things, there are outside noises that may interrupt. 
our ability to recreate or at least patch in those places where we may have had our attention diverted is phonemic re a restoration. In other words, you can have someone slam a door and still make out what the person was saying to you, often with very little difficulty. The idea of phonemic restoration allows us to excuse sloppy speech, especially when we have new language learners like children, but also it allows us to kind of get the full gist of what people are saying. And we understand that there are going to be interfering noises, but also sometimes when we speak, we speak improperly or we mistake what we meant to say and use a different sound. So we eventually start using context as a cue to kind of get this full understanding. In class, I would normally have you guys look away as I would read the next five sentences. And you notice that words like confusion is replaced with gun fusion and busily is worked are replaced with pizzily. Uh, the uh, messenger instead of messenger and suggested instead of suggested, favorably instead of favorably. It's not uncommon for people to stumble when they speak. What we get, though, is that we still understand that in all the gun fusion, the mystery man escaped from the mansion. We don't miss out on what the heart of the sentence was or what the meaning was being that was conveyed. We just kind of patch up or fix up gun fusion to confusion. Um, when these are glaringly obvious, they may draw our attention, but for the most part, we just work past it. This slide essentially summarizes what I just said. And again, Matlin says, sloppy speech happens and it helps us overlook the mistakes made by children. And she cites a case of a child who sang the following words to a famous Christmas carol, oh come all ye hateful, joy fill and their trumpet. And again, we don't really pay attention to it. It's cute, it's funny, but we still get the gist of what someone's trying to say. In your brain, there's a really cool little structure called the superior temporal solstice. And this is an area in the temporal lobe that links what we hear with what we visually see. And the crazy thing is there's a thing called the McGurk effect. And you don't need to remember the McGurk effect, but it's still just kind of a cool um, aside for all of this, that if we were to watch a video of someone saying a sound like ga, with a really kind of hard G sound, ga, and Instead, they changed the visual so we saw the word fa, and fa requires your teeth to kind of push against your lower lip, very different than ga, which comes from the back of your throat. We would actually change what we hear to fit what we're seeing. And so even though we would clearly be hearing ga, and if we closed our eyes, we would hear ga, the minute we look at the mouth, we will mentally change it into what the lips are showing us, and we get that fa. So if you've never had a chance to see bad lip reading, uh, see if the link works here, but or just type in bad lip reading. Um, it's very funny because that's what makes that entire string of videos work. Grammar is going to be the rules for combining symbols with any given language, and that means grammar is going to be unique to language. You have semantics and syntax. Now here comes the word semantics again. I told you before in memory, semantics would be the meaning of so a semantic memory is what is December 25th as opposed to what did you do on December 25th. So semantics, the rules that govern the meaning from morphemes, words, and sentences. And again, it's meaning, but this one is just meaning derived from this part of language. Syntax, however, is the rules in which we construct our sentences. And I think the easiest kind of example to show a difference in syntax is between English language and maybe even French and Spanish. Now I'm more familiar with Spanish. So in English, we would sit there and we would put our descriptors of something um, before the noun, the big yellow dog. But if you looked at Spanish, the noun would come first and then you would wait for the descriptors after. So you know you'd be looking at a dog that was also big and yellow. This is just different ways that different languages construct their rules. We also have things called surface structure and then deep structure. Surface structure is kind of the literalist translation of a statement. And then deep structure means that some statements actually have more than one meaning. So the next couple of sentences that you're going to look at, you can take them more than one way, and that's because they have deep structure. There's more than one meaning that could possibly attach to it. Now, ultimately, these are bad headlines, and so there's the intended versus kind of the other way that you can take them. 
So squad helps dog bite victim or squad helps dog bite victim. So in this one, there's a squad that's helping a dog bite somebody or there's a squad that's helping someone who has been bitten by a dog. As you read through these, enraged cow injures farmer with ax, prostitutes appeal to Pope. Um, again, all of them kind of, if you think about it, there are more than a single way to take it. Drunk gets nine months in a violent, or in violin case and that one, he either did something with a violin case and he's getting nine months in jail or he's spending nine months in a violin case. When we talk about this, sometimes our language has deeper meaning to it and then sometimes it really is just surface structure. We are born with the mental ability to take on any language. As you get older, and we're not talking more than within the first couple months of life, that ability to hear every possible sound starts to very quickly minimize itself. And you essentially streamline yourself for the language that you are surrounded by. So when we're looking at something like this, um, we have Hindi speaking adults. And I don't know what the Hindi T sounds are. I've, I've never heard them myself. But at six to eight months, you can still almost in any infant clearly recognize and discriminate the two sounds. By eight to 10 months, that discrimination has dropped down to maybe the 60, 70% range. 10 to 12 months, you are going to pretty much be limited to your current language. So if you're raised in an English speaking environment, you're going to hear the sounds correct for English. If you were raised in um, a Mandarin speaking environment, you're going to hear the sounds specific for Mandarin. Hindi, you're going to hear the differences in the Hindi language. And again, not all languages utilize all the sounds that we have in the English language. And there are languages that utilize blended sounds or sounds that we don't necessarily use. By about 10 months, you are streamlined for your language. We would say that you become phonemically deaf. You're in, are unable to discriminate other languages, but you do really, really well in your own. This idea of being hardwired for sound has been kind of a point of um, interest for linguistic uh, psychologists. And they also talk about the fact that language has kind of texture to it. It actually has a feeling to it. So this has been an experiment. They've done this with, in brain games. Um, other researchers have done this and they've done two different versions. The one with chocolate and another one with aliens. And the one with chocolate, they say, all right, you have creamy milk chocolate, something that kind of has a silky, soft, smooth feeling to it. And then you have a dark, bitter chocolate. Which one would you call katiki and which one would you call lumbo? And the other way that they've done this is you have a big fat alien that's all blobby and kind of amorphous. And then you have a very um, angular alien that's really sharp and spiky. Which one would you call katiki and which one would you call lumbo? The answer for both of them, whether it's the fat blobby alien um, or the sharp one or the milk chocolate and the dark bitter chocolate, anything that has kind of a soft curvy, creamy, anything that we want to say should go with a soft sound. And so Lombo is what most people choose for the milk chocolate and Lombo is what most people choose for kind of the fat blobby alien. Katiki is usually the sound that people would put with the sharp or kind of angular alien and then also with the kind of bitter dark chocolate. When we look at this, Things like the M sound is often part of the word for mother in pretty much every language. Now here's the fun part. The M sound, that pressing your lips together and humming, is a lot harder than the D sound. So don't get upset if your child says Dada before it says Mama. Mama is physically a harder sound. When we look at acquiring language, at three to four months, babies can babble. What does that mean? It means they can practice with sounds that they hear in their environment, but it's not related to any actual understanding of what those sounds might be. So the baby is going to make all sorts of kind of unrelated sounds. It allows for them to practice with all the different phonemes. And at three to four months, that means phonemes from anywhere in the world. So you get the ba wa wa and the ga and the they'll make spit noises and all that other stuff. This legitimately is just babble. There is no language behind it. It's practice with sounds, facial shapes, movements. 
at 10 months, this is where you get that kind of phonemic um, deafness, where you become really streamlined for your own language. And so the babbling becomes more like household language. But notice here, it's still babbling. So without exposure to any other language, we become functionally deaf to the, the phonemes from other native languages. Anything outside our language, we become unable to hear it as clearly. But again, no language has been acquired yet. We're just practicing getting kind of warmed up to try language. At 12 months, you reach the one word stage. This is where the child will start to utilize very short kind of sounds to indicate household items or things that have been represented in their world. It's usually when children will speak literally in single words, so the one word stage is very literal. When we look at this, a toddler is a child that's usually considered to have just started walking, so we're talking about a kid from one to about two. The big thing with this is that they'll have very little in their actually productive language. Maybe they can say three to 50 words by about 18 months. The great thing is their receptive vocabulary, what they can understand is far greater than their productive vocabulary. So they can understand very complex things, but they may not be able to actually express it. And this is where we start to see kids have some temper tantrums with language. One of our a really quick and easy way to kind of get them to deal with this is use something that they're good at, and that would be gestural language. So there's a million different programs out there for um, sign language for babies, but really very simple things like please, more, all done, very, very simple kind of signs that even infants can do. And it helps them kind of convey meaning uh, that they might not be able to verbally convey. They'll often understand nouns before verbs, but that's because nouns are easier. You can point to a dog and that's very clear and you can point to a chair and that's very obvious. And then you can point to mashed up peas, but it's harder to point to an action. And so they'll have kind of better words for concrete objects, maybe a little bit more difficulty trying to explain things in motion or anything that might be considered a verb. Language begins at this point. So this is where language starts. At 18 months, there's a vocabulary spurt. We have something called fast mapping. Now this is where you wanna be careful. That means a single exposure to a word and the child learns it. So they hear you say one word and they will actually tie it right in. Um, and it'll actually get mapped onto an underlying concept after a single exposure. So we have what we would call a vocabulary spurt. Children at this age will also start to do two different things. They might use overextensions, but they may also use something called an underextension. An overextension, the child starts to use a single term, but use it to describe things that it doesn't really apply to. And under extension, the child understands a term, but can't apply it to other things that it should extend to. What these two things show is that children are trying to understand the rules of language. Here's an example of an overextension. In the center, you have a shiny red ball and the child starts to call apple a ball and the sun a ball and a globe a ball and anything that might even be remotely round or spherical becomes a ball. An underextension, the red shiny ball is a ball, but the soccer ball, the basketball, the football, etc., they can't be balls. This one thing is a ball. And it's funny because you'll see this with little kids when they overextend and they call a complete stranger daddy because it's an adult male, or when they underextend and they can't understand how their friend has a daddy because they're the only ones that have a daddy. That person must be called something else because daddy is just theirs. At 24 months, the next stage you absolutely need to know comes with telegraphic speech. So really what you want to know is this term telegraphic speech. Telegraphic speech at about two years of age, children will use a noun and a verb together and they'll speak really kind of like a telegraph. They'll say things like mommy up, doggy bark, go car. So they omit any of the auxiliary words that you would use to fill in to say something like mommy pick me up or I want to go in the car. 
those words get kind of omitted and you get the very short noun verb pairing. So at about two years of age, expect a child to have very kind of very short punctuated speech, but enough to really kind of give across the message. After about 24 months, the child will start to add more words in. And again, their productive language is going to be far less than their comprehension. So they'll be able to use maybe about 50 to 100 words now, but they'll understand even more. So by age three, most of these overextensions and underextensions start to disappear. What you will see is that children will also start to try to utilize the rules of their language. So they'll try to utilize syntax. But when we talk about an over-regularization, they're going to start to use grammatical rules and possibly use them incorrectly. So English is a weird language. We would say things like, mom went to the store. Well, went and go, mom goes to the store, mom's going to the store, I will go. And then all of a sudden I went. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So the child tries to actively use the ED ending to show past tense and will end up with things like mommy goaded to the store. At this point, the child is trying to use language effectively. You don't want to inhibit that by overcorrecting them. All you have to do is just use a correct model. Just, oh, mom went to the store. By about age five, most children will have acquired proper syntax or have very few issues with syntax when they're talking in their native language. The way that we start to measure whether or not children are learning a language is we use something called mean length of utterance or the MLU. And when you take your children to their doctor, they're going to ask, has your child been able to speak in sentences that are three words long or five words long or seven words long? And really it's just to show whether or not they are taking in the rules and then also some cognitive development. As children get older, their MLUs should become longer. Also with metalinguistic awareness, children as they get older start to understand kind of that language has subtleties and they start to understand metaphors. But even more than that, they start to understand sarcasm. So when we're looking at this, things that have literal or implied meanings, if you're talking to a child usually before the age of six, being sarcastic or using metaphors, that's gonna go over their head. For children six to eight, they're starting to learn it. So every once in a while, you still find yourself having to be careful with things like sarcasm. But what that allows them to do is understand that what is said and how it's said can often be two different things. When we're looking at language development, we can go back to the behaviorist and we can look at Skinner. And remember, Skinner was radical. He felt that language was just a form of operant conditioning. The child says Baba and parents recognize that they think Baba means bottle and so they give the child the bottle, the bottle's reinforcing, the child says Baba again and then eventually, and you can see how that would kind of operate. The problem with this is that no one ever actually models for children goaded or these kind of over-regularizations of linguistic rules. So where are they learning them and then why do they continue with them? When we look at other cognitive neuroscientists, they'll look at neural networks. And this one is actually very correct. Uh, there is a critical period for language acquisition, meaning that if you are not given exposure to language within the first seven or so years of life, if you were raised in isolation or in a place where you cannot have any exposure to language, then the areas in the brain that are meant to take on language essentially get utilized for other purposes and they go away. Once they are gone, you cannot form language. We came across a young woman named Jeannie back in the 70s who had been raised in isolation for 13 years of her life. And again, this is a really horrible situation because it would have been child abuse. Um, Jeannie was able to get vocabulary. She could start to label things. Um, very much like young children, she was really good with nouns. What she couldn't ever get was full syntax. She could never get language past that of roughly about a three-year-old. That brings us to Noam Chomsky. Chomsky was the researcher that was really kind of important during the uh, finding of Genie. Now Chomsky didn't work with Genie, but his theory language acquisition was very new in the 70s. So Chomsky said that all language was inborn and then his theory is the language acquisition device. He says that there is a neural network, a setup in our heads specifically for the acquisition or the acquiring of language. 
he's the one that said Skinner's uh, operant conditioning theory was wrong. They can't imitate things that they haven't been given previous exposure to. And he said that basically we're all born with this ability to take on language. It's natural to humans. However, if given nothing to feed that system, nothing for that device to run off of, eventually the device breaks down. So if you want to think of it kind of like a computer, we are all born with the hardware. We all have an operating system. What we're waiting for is the software. If the software never sh shows up, then eventually the system is useless. So he came up with a critical period for language acquisition, which was later confirmed pretty much through the case study of Genie, but this idea that we are born to take on language. Then we get to Benjamin Worf, and Benjamin Worf has the Worfian hypothesis, but this one's better known as the linguistic relativity hypothesis. So language is relative, and it's relative to your culture. So the where you live, the culture that you live in, it shapes the language that you use, and language shapes how we see the world. So if you've ever had somebody try to explain to you a saying from another language, and you're like, that makes no sense, or it doesn't translate well, it's because it shows how that culture thinks. So Worf or Benjamin Worf, when he was doing his study, he looked at um, the Alaskan Inuit or what we'd consider the Eskimos, and he was the one that came up with the idea that they have, I don't know, like a hundred words for snow. They have several words for snow, far more than what we have. But again, snow is something that is very constant in their environment and that impacts their world. If you look at the Sesame Street um, little clip here, one too many, in cultures where numbers aren't as important and we, we are very number driven, we pay bills, we have house numbers, we count things, I, numbers are very central to our life. Go to a much more primitive culture, one, two, and many might be all they need to really understand their world. So words help us understand and think within our culture. Our culture creates labels and words for things that are important to us. If it's not important, we have fewer words to describe it. This section always brings up the discussion about animal language. Animals can communicate. Animals can problem solve. The question of whether or not animals can walk in someone else's shoes and try to feel and think as they would feel and think, and whether or not animals have full language. Well, the answer to both of those are pretty much no. Communication is not the same as language. And problem solving, while for some animals it's an incredible talent, does not necessarily indicate theory of mind. Wolfgang Kohler looked at chimpanzees, and since chimpanzees genetically are close relatives, gave them a problem where they would have to use increasingly longer sticks to reach a desired object. He said that this meant that chimpanzees had insight. Now some people would still argue that that insight doesn't necessarily indicate that they have language. And for Kohler, um, chimpanzees are natural tool users in the animal kingdom. So again, this doesn't mean because they don't seem to have full language that they're not intelligent. They are intelligent animals. Other animals have language. I hate this slide, but I have to put it out there just because it's always part of the curriculum. Bees can communicate. Many of you guys have seen Bee Movie. You understand that they can communicate. Just because they communicate does not mean they have language. Again, they don't have language. They can fly in different directions to signal different things. Woshu and Coco are actually two examples of primates using language, um, specifically American Sign Language. Coco is the one, um, the researcher that worked with Coco really felt that Coco could kind of generate full syntax. Um, the reality is, is that outside researchers have never been able to actually show that Coco could. Both Coco and Woshu were unable to show language acquisition past that of a three-year-old. So again, they could convey some meaning, they could convey emotion, they could convey some thought, but they didn't master it past kind of a very basic level. So again, 150 signs versus 600 signs. However, we would sit there and say that humans have far more language and while they could convey very simple thoughts, they really didn't have full acquisition of language. Finishing this up, things that you guys should remember. No morphemes, phonemes, syntax, semantics. 
Babbling is where you're practicing, but one word stage language begins. No telegraphic speech, Skinner's theory, definitely no Chomsky and the Worfian hypothesis. No those overextensions, under, under extensions, what we'd call over regularizations or over generalizations. And you'll have a couple of questions on Moshu and Coco. Um, actually, probably one. And again, they didn't have language. So that's it. That's what we would have gone over in class. If you have any questions, please let me know.